Are you dealing with infightings within your team? Are you having trouble gaining visibility in front of equity salespeople and clients? Do you not respect your analysts or your analysts just too hands off? In this multi-episode series, I will share my advice on how Southside Equity Research Associates should tackle these issues. Let's get right into it. There are four main buckets of skills you should develop during your time in equity research. Financial analysis and modeling, strategic thinking, sector expertise, and selling and relationship building. Unless you work at an elite boutique that monetizes on client subscriptions, come to terms now that working in equity research is not really about picking stocks. The more appropriate term is equity marketing. The sooner you come to terms with that, the better you might adjust to getting the work done, helping your analysts and your franchise succeed, and learning what you can learn. Most people don't stay in this profession for life. Everyone on your team, including your analysts, has their own motives. You won't know what their motives are until over time. Too many associates take it for granted that they will have good exit opportunities. No, nothing will come really easily. Your career prospect almost always hinges on how good you are. If you don't know your stuff, you won't get good exits, no matter how many years you stay in equity research. If you're smart and can really prove your quality of work and knowledge, you can land a lucrative corporate job or buy side research as soon as it opens up. For example, buy siders treat sell side associates like a second class citizen because they know the profession has zero skin in the game and is merely a liaison amongst many parties. Based on all the client events I have been to, older clients are generally nicer and I can tell who used to work on the sell side because they're generally more understanding of the crap we have to deal with and being of service to buy siders. Conversely, the pricks are usually the young guy who who got into the buy side right after college. They won't recognize your presence. They demand to speak directly with your analysts because their shops are top commission payers. Just be aware of these dynamics so you understand why people behave in certain way and why I never bother bringing my business card as an associate. If you're going corporate, a lot of mid to senior level managers on the corporate side have no idea what skills high finance professionals can bring because they started in corporate as a financial analyst or as a CPA. Sell side Analysts are great at their job, but most of them are the worst managers. Welcome to Wall Street, where people make big bucks for producing, not for leading or mentoring. Most analysts care too much about generating revenue to care about what you want for your career. You need to be your own people manager and hold yourself to the highest professional standards if you want to succeed. If you don't work hard, don't wonder why you don't progress like your peers. I got a question on how to stay motivated when you are treated like a earnings monkey and your boss rarely talks to his associates. Look, you might work for a II Hall of Famer who is just cruising and milking the goodwill she has built over her career. But they have a few houses in the Hamptons. You don't. You have to motivate yourself so you can break into a path where you want to build a long-term career. And don't expect your analysts to change for you. They're set in their ways. To the closet buy siders like myself, your analysts didn't hire you to be a great investor. You can develop industry expertise on the job, but you won't learn how to invest on the job, especially if you want to be a long-term investor. You got to put in your own work. You have to proactively discover your own philosophy, acquire mentors, and learn the skills. Check out my investing reading list and my buy side research playlist. They should be great resources for you. Link in the video description below. And don't waste time pondering which analyst should I hop to instead to learn to be a good stock picker. They exist on the sell side, but they're very rare. If you don't like the job, that's okay. I didn't like the job. I have a social media following to prove that. But I loved being exposed to companies and the market. You should still constantly find ways to be useful to your analysts. Always think about what busy work you can do so that your analysts can take one more client call or think about another note idea. I don't know about you, at least it feels better to be contributing when you work in a job you hate. Equity research is a client service profession. You should be constantly building relationships. Take advantage of your access to a diverse array of powerful and smart people, Wall Street professionals, public company C-suite management, and institutional investors. It can't hurt to build deep relationship with these people regardless of what you want to do for the rest of your career. Work on your people skill and learn to be liked by as many people as possible. These relationships strengthen over time and can lead to mentors, future clients, job leads, and even business opportunities. Don't make things up. If you don't know the answer, say, I will get back to you and actually go find the answer and get back to them. Your clients have to be right on their job to make money. 
Investing requires intellectual honesty. If you tell them factually false things, there's zero chance that they will like you. That hurts you and your analyst. Best case is the client won't call you again. The worst case is if you did this to a big client and your analyst found out about it, you will be fired. You must understand things on a first principle basis. Don't use jargons to fool yourself and your clients. Your clients will call you out. What do you really mean by that jargon? If you go on to invest for real, the market will tell you you are wrong and that you don't know your stuff. To give you an example, during a mock interview I asked a client, how would you go about analyzing the Chinese cosmetics industry, which is a sector he covered as an intern. He answered using one sentence, I use the Porter's five forces. Then there was awkward silence. I knew I can break him, so I probed further. Walk me through how you will use Porter's five forces to analyze the Chinese cosmetics industry. He was like, uh, I don't know. So hiding behind jargons won't work against research professionals. Really understand what you need to understand. And it is true, if you cannot explain a complex concept to a five-year-old or your grandma, you don't understand it deeply enough. When you do know your stuff, sometimes you have to take a stand and not let a more senior teammate bully you. They're not always right. Write things down. Most of us don't have superhuman memories. Writing helps remembering. Constantly refine your workflow. So much time is wasted on this job because of disorganized bosses, information asymmetry, and painting ass supervisory analysts. You need to control what you can control. Time the execution of your core task and think about ways to automate. Small process improvements really add up. For those who are thinking about corporate after equity research. A lot of the roles have a big process management component. You might as well start now. Learn one Excel trick a day. There are a lot of busy work on this job. The sooner you can automate and complete these low level tasks, the sooner you can do some actual research. See big picture of how your businesses create and destroy value and build your own brand in front of clients. And leverage AI. This is very topical. You can ask ChatGPT pretty much anything. They can save a lot of time. It's like you have access to your own senior analyst who is not getting pulled in 20 different directions. Just make sure you validate what ChatGPT spits out because ChatGPT doesn't always give the right answer. I'm not up to date on what ChatGPT can or cannot do, but I've heard folks use it to generate SQL codes or design a web page. So if you don't know a Excel shortcut key, ask ChatGPT. It's more targeted than Googling an answer. And have a personality. Most of the research notes fit into one of these permutations. Client call you sometimes because they like you and can relate to you in a certain way. Think about what makes you unique and infuse those qualities into your communications. No matter how great your note is, if your title is bad and you're wordy on page one, people are not gonna read it. It's just like people won't click on a YouTube video because of a shitty title and a poor thumbnail. The world will never know how great your video is. It's the exact same idea. Start to have views. Yes, sell side has an option to stay on the sideline, but you cannot stay on the sideline for all of your cover name. Clients are looking for a debate to plug their intellectual blind spots. They will pull up rating for a name and call the analyst who sell rated on something the client might want to buy and vice versa. As you progress in this profession, you need to start taking career risk by taking a side on a name. And only a controversy is one of the ways to make a name in this profession. Learn to develop a thick skin. You're going to be wrong publicly. At least you don't lose money because you're not an investor. But it still sucks when you say the company is going to beat and raise and the company tanks 40%. CEO left and they're going to dilute the fuck out of their shareholders. And next day for you, 10 pot shop clients are going to call you and be like WTF. You got to get used to that. Triple check your work. Build a reputation by having strong attention to detail. That way your senior analyst will trust you and give you more more responsibility. That's how you grow. Learn to be super organized. Use folders in Outlook, OneNote, whatever. Even if you hate your cover sector, outsiders still value an industry expert's knowledge. I will become an expert in your sector while exploring a move that suits your long-term interest. Learn to skim. There are many free and paid resources on how to read quickly and for better comprehension. Pass your serious exams ASAP. I see people on forums get stressed out about these four part exams and ask for study tips or even willing to pay for tutors. Maybe I'm very harsh on this, but in my opinion, this is Wall Street. If you struggle to pass these exams, what makes you think you will succeed in whatever comes after equity research? Or what is your prospect within the industry? It's really straightforward. Practice them hard, get them done. Then 
One, you're now put on a map with names showing up on research reports. Two, now you can talk to equity salespeople and institutional clients. And three, you can build your own brand for whatever your career goal is. Just get them done ASAP. And dress well. This is especially important for younger associates because most clients in C-suite are not going to remember that 22-year-old junior associate working for the analyst. At the very least, if you dress well, you make a good visual impression via presentation. It can't hurt. Be good with people's names. Write down their name and three things about them. Everyone wants to be recognized. So the next time you meet that person, that person feels like you give him or her extra attention by making an effort. We have Reg FD now, but there's still shenanigans here and there that you need to play along. Just be aware, if SEC is not going after politicians insider trading, you whistleblowing on these shenanigans will not do you any good. Read company and industry specific books for oil and gas, oil 101, any Daniel Jurgen book for basic materials, world for sale, for telecom, cable cowboy, for semiconductor, chip war. You can check out my entire industry book list in the video description. You need to acquire an industry analysis framework. Really master either Porter's Five Forces or the Seven Power Framework. These two frameworks are the only things I can think of that are equally applicable to every single business in any industry you will ever look at. I've summarized Helmer's book in my newsletter before. I've linked to my notes in the video description that might save you some time. I do plan to make videos about the seven power framework in the future as well, so stay tuned. Keep a journal of news and events on your companies and your industry. Over time, you should be better at knowing what's material and what's noise. Did you think the news is positive, negative, or neutral to the company? How did the stock react? Does that line up with your view? How did the news impact the other companies in your industry? No client values your breadth of knowledge. When a client calls, they need your deep knowledge on names they are working on. So for juniors, depth is more valuable than breadth if you want to build your own brand with clients. In my opinion, a good analyst should divide her coverage and let associates be a shadow lead on a subset of companies. If you happen to work for an analyst who makes every associate know all the covered companies, I highly recommend you secretly go deeper on a subset of company that either interests you the most or have the highest client interest. It's always easier to expand into your team's entire coverage over time if you choose. How do you develop variant perception? One, you need to know your sector very well and every company and industry is different. Two, you need to accept that knowing an industry takes time. Be a student of your industry's history to start developing pattern recognition of why at the time the market was wrong about XYZ or undervaluing certain opportunity. When you first start in equity research, focus on learning how to crank the current models, how to populate the earnings using companies' earning results and forecast it forward. When I first started, I practiced doing the earnings before the earnings season to see how quickly I can do it. It comes with practice and it gets better over time. But when you have downtime, I highly recommend building the models of your cover companies from scratch by looking at your analyst models. You will be forced to distill down what really drives a model from a first principle basis and what drives the revenue and cost of the business. And that's when you realize how unnecessary it is to have a 2000 line model. Don't assume the model you work with is free of errors. Your analysts and your teammates are way too busy to check everything. If you found some error, let your boss know. If it's an error, fix it. I will document the modeling assumptions in a separate file. It will help you when you work on the model next time or when a client asks about your assumptions. I understand it's more convenient to leave comments inside the model, but remember these models are sent to clients. Make sure you don't say anything stupid or reveal any material non-public information. A lot of you love to know what matters even when that's something that can take many years to master. It depends on the company and its business model. But generally think about changes in what KPI has the biggest impact to the key financial metrics of any business, which is revenue, EBITDA, free cash flow, or earnings per share. If the company has three operating segments, which segment constitute the majority of the company's operating profit? If a segment is only 5% of the company's total operating profit, and it's not growing that quickly, you know the client won't care as much because it doesn't 
drive the free cash flow generation of the business. Make sure you save your file before running an Excel macro because there is no undo after a macro run. Equity research models are full of landmines. One will be named fields. Just be super careful about deleting name fields because other parts of the file might depend on it. And you have no idea what part because you inherited the model. When you operate on a tab with hidden columns and rows, either expand all of them or select only visible cells because you might have overwritten things in the hidden rows and columns. I wouldn't stress so much about how to write a equity research note. It comes over time and it's much less difficult than you think. The key is to conform to your analyst's writing style because that is part of her brand. Your analyst's writing could be far from perfect, but your job is to do the writing and produce as final of a product as possible to save time for your analyst. You can work on being a concise, persuasive writer on your own time. Most clients don't even read your note. By regulation, teams need to publish the view before being allowed to discuss that view with equity sales and clients. Writing the note is going through the motion just so you have something concrete to pin clients to set up calls. Now you understand why you still have to read earnings notes even when no one other than your analyst reads it because pot shop clients will call the next day and you cannot share the view until you have published that view. That's why earnings season is such a terrible lifestyle for us. That said, readership is something research management track. That's the hook to get clients on a call which your firm monetizes in a few ways via commissions or explicit fees for calls. You might want to unlearn all the creative writing skills. We're trying to communicate views to institutional clients, not trying to win the Pulitzer Prize. You need a strong title and a first page. Make sure your conclusions are upfront. We're upgrading this stock because of this reason. We're initiating on this company. You will do a lot of regurgitation of press releases. Just make sure you tell clients what the news means to the stock. In general, focus on the so what. What does this note mean for your stock and for your industry? What action can clients take using this note. Repurpose previous reports and exhibits. No need to reinvent the wheel. Someone asked me, how do I differentiate? Clients get 20 plus email from equity salespeople from different brokers every day. Why do they open yours? You make them money, you make them think, or they like you. There are infinite ways to differentiate. I wouldn't worry so much about it now until you have your own coverage. Your boss already has his or her way of differentiating. You just need to focus on executing the task that reinforce that differentiation. As you progress, you do need to think about what angle you want to pursue as a source of differentiation. You can observe your boss's angle and see if that's a direction you want to pursue. Or you can go in your own way. Deep industry knowledge, good channel check, being outrageous but thought provoking around those moonshot opportunities. You don't have to differentiate in many ways. You just have to find a way where you can have a relative domination and that is within your circle of competence. Don't spend time on things you cannot differentiate. Given the incentive alignment in equity research, adding value to the highest commission payers who are usually the multi-managers is a prudent move. If three clients ask the same question, that means no one else on the street has clarified that confusion and you should pitch your boss to write a note on it. And don't forget, being yourself is a way to differentiate because it's your voice, it's your style, it's your personality that made the client want to talk to you. If you know a certain product of yours is well received, that should be a staple product. I know Know an analyst that does proxy statement analysis. It saves investor time from digging through each proxy statement to know how management is compensated. So much of equity research is mastering the team's workflow. If you master this, you will become very entrenched, which helps your job security. I will take your first compliance training very seriously. You need to comply with these regulations anyway. As part of the team, your actions impact your team's reputation and regulatory compliance. When you are speaking with external parties, your team's view and stock ratings are what you need to message. That is the house view. Some clients will get on a call and ask, well, what do you think about a stock? Remember, you're not allowed to message your own thesis on a stock when you are representing the team. 
If you think equity research as a profession doesn't make any sense, I strongly agree. But this was a much more outrageous profession pre-regulation FD. Just look at these guys broker check. Today, this is a highly regulated industry. When you are unsure about how to proceed on something, I recommend always asking your teammates or senior analysts just to make sure. Making assumptions about what you can communicate to sales and clients can get your team in trouble. It can help your work-life balance if you document your process very well. Write down how things are done for the routine task so you don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. For example, weekly comp sheet or monthly oil well analysis. Follow the steps to the dot. Use a checklist so you don't miss any steps and minimize any back and forth with your boss and with the SAs. Remember, it's the analysis results that help clients make investment decisions. So try your best to minimize the amount of time spent on doing the work so you have more time to think about what the results mean. Now let's transition to a discussion on how you can maximize your relationship with various parties within the equity research ecosystem. Your senior analyst is your overlord and number one customer. You will go on in your career being able to claim that you have worked for John Smith at this bank. And if your counterparty has ever worked in this ecosystem, having worked for John Smith means something about your credibility. Ultimately, I think every analyst likes an associate who knows their stuff and is good at getting the work done without much supervision. So the work should do the talking. That said, you are essentially working in a small business. So having a good personal relationship can hurt. At least know their birthday. Small thing, never compromise accuracy to achieve efficiency. Pay attention to your analyst's feedback on your work. Always think about how to make your work product as final deliverable as possible without any edits, which saves time for everyone. I got a question on how does equity research add value to the firm as a whole? I think equity research adds value to the firm in a lot of ways. But the big challenge is bank management doesn't see the impact quantitatively. As historically, equity research has always been a cost center. The shortest answer of how equity research adds value to the firm is it helps the firm sell other services. Most of you know how equity research helps investment banking. As an associate, you don't need to worry as much about adding value to the firm. Let your boss worry about that. You just need to focus on adding value to your boss and her franchise. If you like the boss and should your boss decide to move the franchise to another firm, you will follow her anyways. There are many setups here. You can be the sole associate supporting the analyst. There can be VP and director on a team. There can be multiple associates. Try to make friends with your teammates. They have been on a team for longer and they can help resolve information asymmetry for you. They know where files are stored on a shared drive, why your analyst did certain analysis five years ago. They know all the quirks of your analyst and have the best tips on how to deal with them. Everyone has different motives in this profession. You just don't know what they are. So when there is a disagreement within the team, especially with another associate, try to understand where they're coming from. That will help you feel better and might help you devise ways to resolve the conflict. I wasn't surprised to get multiple questions along the line of how do you resolve infighting within a research team? and how to gain visibility and avoid the backstabbing. Yeah, this is always tricky. I can only try to make you feel better. First of all, you need to understand there is seniority on the team, which means your teammates have a head start on relationship with your analysts, with equity salespeople, and with clients. Second of all, your situation depends on how the analyst manages these conflicts. I could be wrong, but I suspect most, if not all the time, analyst knows there is infighting, but they are like your parents. Your parents have favorites, but they cannot tell you who is their favorite. And if your analyst has been in the business for a long time, I firmly believe they know which associate is intrinsically good and which one isn't. And that means for you, you need to focus on what you can control, which is to know your shit. Learn about your cover company, improve every day so you can add value to your team and to clients. You just need to stay patient. Eventually, intrinsic talent wins over everything. That's my belief. If it doesn't work on this team, you're allowed to take your talent elsewhere when it's the right opportunity. Don't waste so much time scheming ways to backstab others to get ahead. If your teammate is doing that to you, don't sink so low to their level. These backstabbing might work better in traditional corporate jobs, but in a skill-based profession, clients want to talk to people who know their
Okay, your time and energy are best spent on becoming better at your job. Don't waste so much time scheming ways to backstab others to get ahead. If your teammate is doing that to you, don't sink so low to their level. These backstabbing might work better in traditional corporate jobs, but in a skill-based profession, clients want to talk to people who know their shit. Your time and energy are best spent on becoming better at your job. What can you control? To increase visibility in front of your analysts, let the good work do the talking. To increase visibility in front of equity salespeople, be proactive on building the relationship. I will discuss more in the equity salespeople section. To increase exposure to clients, that's tougher because more senior teammates might hog all the client costs. It just takes time. Some of your teammates will leave the team and you get moved up. That's just how this profession works. Just focusing on knowing your stuff and your companies. Eventually, it will be your time to shine. If you believe you're ready and you want client access and your boss and teammates are blocking it, Go direct, especially to the clients who don't use the sell side. If your goal is to find buy side jobs, just position it as networking instead of soliciting businesses. I tell you my personal experience. My teammate loves the sell side profession, which on one hand drove me crazy because he has 20 ideas always on more marketing related stuff. As a closet buy sider, I couldn't care less about this PR stuff. But because of that dynamic, we work very well together at times because I will let him run the show on these PR stuff while I go read another 10k and chat with my closet buy sider colleague on the hotline retail team. People behave in certain ways because of their motives. Try to find out what their motives are. It's a way for you to develop empathy of why they're hogging client calls or want so much of your analyst's attention. And network with prior associates who work for your analyst. I got job leads from my boss's prior associates who are now wildly successful on the corporate side and on the buy side. They of course also know how to deal with your analyst's quirks. They can just be good mentors. And it's very easy to initiate the conversation because you guys have the same master seafood. Equity salespeople are your channel to institutional investors. They are sort of the junior clients. If you're wondering why equity salespeople exist, you might want to check out my prior video on how sales side equity research works. You probably have heard equity sales is a dying profession, but they're also not going away because their high touch approach to client service is needed when the client base is super fragmented. There are over 8,000 hedge funds and 500 mutual fund companies in the US alone, and each client wants to be treated like they're the most important client. It's impossible for your analysts to give that kind of dedicated attention to all of them all at once. And each mutual fund company also has hundreds of portfolio managers that the salespeople need to manage relationship on a one-on-one -on -one basis. That's the salespeople's value add. You want to be good to them because they are your team's message amplifier. They create time leverage. On a good day, your boss can make 20 client calls, but each salesperson can make 30 to 50 calls to their client. If five salespeople do that, 150 to 250 clients know about your boss's note that day and might want to chat. It really scales up your analyst's reach. In front of salespeople, you need to one, demonstrate you know your company. Two, find ways for them to know that you exist on the research team. Three, make them like you. On a day, your boss goes on morning call. call the salespeople you're comfortable talking to and ask to clarify their questions about your boss's pitch. It's a good practice for you to be able to answer questions on your cover company. And these calls are great touch points to help salespeople remember you. Over time, salespeople should connect you to smaller clients if your senior analyst is willing to give you that exposure. That's how you build your own brand. If your analyst does not allow you to talk to salespeople no matter how good you are, you need to think about whether that's someone you want to work for. If salespeople are not clear about your analyst's pitch, they won't sell it to their buy side client. They will tell clients something that's unclear or worse. They will just sell another analyst's report that day. So spoon feed salespeople the story you want them to say for maximum impact. You want to be generally proactive in front of salespeople. This is not a if you write it, they will read type industry. If you work in the office, go down to the trading floor on a Friday to say hi to the sales and trading people when things are slower. At many shops, salespeople vote on research associates. Part of your performance is based on these internal client votes. So it's quite important for your career. Their votes on you have increasing weight as you progress in the profession. Salespeople could vote for you because of your stock knowledge, but they could also vote because they like you. 
regardless of whether you want to serve them or work for them for a career. Buy side clients are where your brand really lies. You need to answer every client email, return every client phone call. Feel honored that clients are choosing you to talk to for their needs when a lot of them have access to the entire equity research profession. Answer their correspondence promptly. Every client wants to feel they're a top priority. Some of the smaller clients can actually become a big commission payer if they can scale. Cultivate every relationship. Some clients just want to talk. Just be a good listener. You will have clients who know nothing about your sector. Give them extra attention. This is your chance to demonstrate relative sector expertise. If you can add value consistently to them, that relationship can span your entire sales side career. Conversely, be a good listener when you serve sector expertise. You're unlikely to know as much about the sector as they do. And they have been right on many stock calls that you can learn from their pattern recognition. You don't need to respect all clients and all investment styles. But if you do respect certain clients, try to understand their investment philosophy deeply. You can check out my investment style video. In there, I help you understand the entire spectrum of ways to make money in the stock market, ranging from pod shop, all the way to long-term investing. For example, if you're doing a call with a more long-term oriented investor, impress them with your depth of knowledge on the competitive position or deep knowledge about the business that can enhance the effectiveness of your delivery and help you make a strong impression with that client. I got a few questions on how to speak confidently in front of clients. Few things, the key to confidence is adequate preparation. If you know your stuff, I think you will be more confident. The salesperson scheduling the call will typically let you know what stocks the client wants to talk about. I'll just brush up on these stocks in terms of what has happened recently with these companies and their stocks. What are the debates? What is your team's view on the future and why? This is where knowing as much as possible about these specific companies can come in handy because you never know what clients want to talk about. And it just comes with time as you're better prepared for the permutation of questions. After a while, you realize they usually just ask the same set of questions. Then you should be more confident about doing future client calls. There are always going to be clients with questionable ethics who somehow still have a job in the industry. If they are probing for non-public material information, better to deflect than divulge. The other sector associates at your bank are your support group. They can be invaluable resources to learn how to deal with your senior analysts or if you have interpersonal issues within the team because they have their own team dynamics to deal with. This might just be me because I'm very curious about different types of industries and hoping to learn as many mental models as I can. Go hang out with the other sector's associates to learn about trends in their industry. It's good to be informed. You never know something you learn from them can help you better understand your sector and the world. If trading rules allowed, you can actually invest in companies outside your sector and may find good ideas to invest in by talking to other sector's associates. Unless you're talking to a closet buy -sider. I'll be careful about following their published opinions. We just saw Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse going through big changes. People get fired and laid off in this business, especially in a turbulent environment like this. If your bosses let go, you might not lose your job, but you can get orphaned. The director of research will ask around other sector teams to see whom is willing to pick you up. You will have to interview with other industry teams. If you are close with some of the other sector teams already, especially with their analysts, you have a higher chance of getting a placement and avoid being laid off. You never know when the relationship you have already built will pay off. I got a question about relationship with investment bankers when you work in equity research. I wouldn't worry so much about that relationship as a junior equity research associate. You're not allowed to speak with your investment banking counterparts unless in the presence of a compliance person. Just know at times ratings get magically changed to a buy or your team picked up coverage on a company that doesn't really fit into the theme of your analysis coverage universe. And that could be due to some business needs on the investment banking side. When you go to an industry conference or an analyst day, you will bump into competitor analysts and their associates and clients too. Building relationship with competing analyst associates is another way to learn how to deal with issues that may arise on your team. You also get to hear how to manage your career progress within the industry if these associates are farther ahead of you in career ladder. They can help you ramp on your sector too. They're a good heat check 
on whether you're fairly compensated or which analyst within the sector is good to work for or is a good mentor. Finally, they are job leads. Associates with direct sector coverage experience are incredibly valuable. You should be the first to know which competing analyst has junior turnovers and can make a move should you choose. Just know if you're moving within the sector, it's always ugly because it's a huge ego hit to your analyst when they lose a junior person to a direct competitor. That means when you give notice, you will lose your computer access immediately on that day and your analyst might never speak with you again. But sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. Another general point with your associate peers, they will go on to corporate or buy side or business school. They can provide perspectives on a career outside of equity research. Building that network with associates at your bank and outside the bank can help in so many ways. Company management is not as much of a focus for juniors because most senior analysts own the C-suite relationships of cover companies. But remember, not many 25-year-old get to sit in a meeting with a Fortune 100 CEO and CFO. So at least act appropriately. Don't say anything stupid. Don't reveal any confidential information. These are very powerful people. Your career could be over before you even begin. Over time, you will need to build relationship with company management. While being a pleasant, charming person cannot hurt, I think the foundation of earning management respect is by knowing their business very well. Just observe how your analyst does it. That will become your toolkit for building strong relationship with company management. A very small note from an ex buy sider. Remember that equity research is a relationship job. You're not the short seller, so don't ask overly hostile questions. <music> Sell side analysts are great at their job, but most of them are terrible managers. Well, welcome to Wall Street, where people rise to the top and make big bucks for producing, not for leading or mentoring. Most of the senior analysts care too much about generating revenue to care about what you want for your career. You need to be your own people manager and hold yourself to higher standard if you want to succeed. Becoming a Wall Street senior analyst is not for everyone and that's okay. You just need to figure out what your long-term goal is and when to leave the industry. Keep a mistake log. We are humans. You will make mistakes. When you make a mistake, note it down in a log. So at the very least, you should never make the same mistake twice. At least it creates a perception that you're learning from your mistakes. How do you know if you're progressing as a junior? After two to three earning seasons, you should be familiar with how to do a earnings, updating the model and writing the note on what happened in the quarter and what your forward view of the company is. At year two and onward, you should have a decent grasp of big industry trends and develop deep knowledge of major companies and know the metrics that drive their stocks. The rest is about knowing as many nuances as you can about your cover companies and the industry itself. For most industries, the variant view is in the detail. For your annual performance review, I know plenty of analysts who ask their associates to write their own reviews. And going forward, that will probably involve ChatGPT. So it's pretty much useless. If your analyst does give actual feedback, definitely note them down and incorporate into your daily performance going forward. During your performance review, you should be vocal about what you want out of your time on the sell side, as long as it is within the scope of the profession. You cannot say, hey, I want to learn how to be a better investor. That kind of aspiration, you have to pick it up on your own. A more reasonable ask would be, hey, I think I can help you handle serving smaller clients, or I want more autonomy on deep dive notes, but I want to be given credit with my name right below yours when the report is published. Often analysts are so busy getting pulled in 20 directions that they don't know you're not developing or getting the recognition. You have to leave equity research for the right reason. And the following situations warrant a introspection on whether to stick with your current analyst. If they are doing something wildly illegal or unethical, that's a no-brainer. Leave. You don't want to associate with something like that. That's a tough one as there are tons of verbal abusers out there. If they don't make you better, leave. 
Otherwise, I suggest stick it out. Learn, actively discover what your passion is, and then make a move accordingly. Poor work-life balance is also a tough one because equity research is a grind. Too many constituents to please, too many low-value tasks to complete just to stay visible in a highly competitive and undifferentiated industry. All analysts have their quirks you have to deal with. So I don't recommend jumping ship unless 1. Work-life balance is impacting your personal health or your obligation to your family. Seriously, it's not worth it if you're not even the analyst and there's absolutely no need to stick with a job that demands 80 hours a week with no clear path of becoming a covering analyst while you just had a newborn and getting paid less than 200000 If your analyst hoards all client interactions and does all the technical work, it's very bad for your career development and brand building. Bring up the issue with the analyst at appropriate times, such as a year-end review. If they don't change, leave. I got a question on what's the best leverage I can have to negotiate compensation. Well, having another offer in hand is the best leverage. If you're unhappy about a bonus, and it's not because of poor performance, you can choose to look, but you know spots rarely open up. And you also have to deal with the uncertainty of your new boss's quirk. You can use my compensation survey to negotiate, but you know if you work at a middle market bank, you know the salary differential will persist. Because middle market banks have less deal flow, they might focus on differentiating in smaller cap stocks, that means less trading volume and less commission. And quibbling over twenty to thirty thousand dollars in annual compensation really doesn't matter in the long run. You can also leave the industry, but your career narrative completely changes. So that's a risk for you. The two year mark is a general rule of thumb to start thinking about your exit. If you already know you don't want to do equity research for life. From that point on, the job becomes somewhat repetitive and become more and more about sales than research. By that point, your technical skills are solid enough for many exit options. You also should have developed some understanding of that particular industry to be perceived as an industry expert. For those who want to pursue the buy side route, check out my buy side playlist to learn more. Link in the description below. Don't feel bad about leaving. If tomorrow an analyst decides to become the head of IR at a Fortune 100 company, she wouldn't consider your career goal in her decision making process. If your bank decides to cut costs, they certainly would not consider your feelings and livelihood into their decision. Everyone is for themselves on Wall Street. Equity research is no exception. Associates leaving the industry is a feature, not a bug of the profession. The veterans have seen people come and go. They will and should understand. Just to reiterate though, you have to leave for the right reasons and for the right role. I get a lot of questions on which exit options are better. If you put a gun to my head, I will tell you buy side has the highest financial upside. Just keep in mind, everything in life has trade off. Buy side has the highest compensation upside. But what comes with that is the highest stress level and instability, especially if you choose to pursue a career at a hedge fund. And don't assume long only mutual fund is totally chill. It's still a risk taking job. At the end, if you don't add value as an investor, you will be let go. And you and me both know plenty of people would love to take your seat on the buy side. With that said, let's run through your options. Investor relation. Your skills are very transferable to this profession. You know what sell side analysts are looking for, what investors are looking for, how management wants to message their story. It's a natural transition and a move many senior equity research analysts even make when they want to slow down in their careers. Depends on the level of entry, you can submit a job application or the head of a company's IR might poach you. Or you can always pitch yourself to a head of IR to source your own job lead. There's also the buy side. How transferable are your skills depends on what investment style you're pursuing. I want to make clear a few things around pot shop. I've seen that during my time in equity research. I've seen that with my client. I have seen that on online forum. Let's make that clear up front. Pod shops are bottom tier buy side exits, not top tier. I saw someone on the forum using the term max seats, and I thought that was a pretty hilariously accurate way to describe that path. I've known equity research person who joined a pod shop, got blown up, and begged for her old job back in equity research after one to two months. The pod shops are large hedge funds in scale, but you don't really work for the platform. You will work for a pod under the platform. 
Just like you don't work for the bank, you work for an analysis franchise within the bank as a equity research associate. People in equity research pursue part jobs because their colleagues covering other sectors have gone that route. It's just like college students started as pre-med, pre-law, or pre-business just to graduate with some random major. And too many MBA students recruit for investment banking and management consulting for the exact same reason, because their peers are. If you don't work hard to figure out what your investment style truly is, you will suffer the consequence of your decision in terms of lifestyle and career stability. The harder seats to get are the at scale single manager hedge fund and long only mutual fund. When people make a comment like, oh well, I've seen my colleagues got into a top hedge fund with less than one year of experience in sell side research, there's almost a zero chance that person got into a top single manager hedge fund or a mutual fund. Another frequent question I get is, how much time should I stay on the sell side before going for the buy side? The generic answer is it will take a year and a half and two years for firms to be receptive to your application. But the bigger and real question is, are you ready to form real views and pick stocks? Have you bridged the gap between what you did in equity research and how you need to think like an investor on the buy side. Some will never get there. Some were ready before they joined the sell side because they have been listening to Invest Like the Best podcast every week and reading all the Buffett letters front and back three times. They have been looking at different companies and forming views on their investability. Just doing your equity research job year in and year out won't magically make you shine on your buy side interview. And there's also corporate, which is a big bucket. There are many internal finance related roles in corporate that you can do. Most often people exit to FP&A, strategic finance, corporate development, and strategies and operation. There are many sub functions within these tracks as well. It will take some convincing for them to let you in because some mid to senior level people in corporate have never worked in financial services. So they might not even know what equity research exactly is, aside from the fact that it has something to do with stocks. I think with enough effort to close the skill gap and tell the right story, you have a shot at all the exit opportunities on the corporate side that investment bankers and management consultants can exit to. And there's business school. Having done an MBA, I only want to make one point. Only people with the clearest post MBA career goals make the most out of their MBA experience. So I highly recommend knowing very clearly what exactly you want out of your MBA before you even apply. Uh, I don't know, maybe investment banking or consulting is the worst answer that I have heard from at least 20 to 30% of my MBA classmates when we began MBA. If you want a two year vacation, don't do an MBA. Just quit your job and travel around the world for two years. It's probably cheaper than doing an MBA. You won't learn much in the classroom. I spent most of my MBA in the library and during the second year, I interned four days a week at a hedge fund. Really know why you need an MBA before you apply. If you found this helpful, please click like and subscribe. Be sure to check out my other published content on the next screen. Thanks for watching.